can hear this. Um, I just want to confirm that everybody can hear me and that I am live. Um, so welcome in. Hello, hello. I just want to make sure that you all are here and that you can hear me. So go ahead and type in the chat if you're here. I already see that there are a couple of people hear this. So um, I just want to confirm that everybody can hear me and that I am live. Um, so welcome in. Hello, hello. I just want to make sure that you all are here and that you can hear me. So chat if you're here, go ahead and type in the chat if you're here. I already see that there are a couple of people hear this. So um, I just want to confirm that everybody can hear me and that I am live. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> this is what happens when you have way too many tabs open. I'm like hearing myself delayed talking on different tabs. Um, welcome in. We are now officially good to go. Uh, it's so good to have all of you here. I see people typing in the chat. Um, hello from Hong Kong. Oh my gosh. Thanks so much for joining us, Joyce. Uh, hey, Talis. Hey, Bev. And um, hello, Pianista. Uh, so great to have all of you. I'm really excited to be here tonight. We are going to be talking about scales and uh, rhythm and sight reading and technique. And it's gonna be a really, really, really great time. So I'm just gonna throw this up here on the screen and that way you will all be able to see it and we'll dive in and get started. So I'm curious how your homework went from Monday. I would love if you would type in the chat if you've already started implementing things that we talked about like journaling your practice and creating your practice routine and really being mindful about what you're doing and how you're spending your time. Um, I hope that that is going well and I wanna hear all about it if you're willing to share. So type that in the chat or type that in the comment section of the video if you're watching this later. Um, as I said tonight, we're talking about technique, scales, rhythm, and sight reading. And I have some somewhat controversial opinions about um, scales and technical exercises. Um, I think my opinions about rhythm and sight reading are pretty standard, but the other ones might be somewhat controversial. So I'm going to tell you what my opinions are, and then we'll dive in and we'll talk about it. And I'm going to teach you the ways to practice these various topics um, so that you can really get the benefit from them because, um, yeah, well, we'll dive into it. So my opinions about, um, technical exercises are that they do have some benefits and there's definitely a time and a place to practice technical exercises, but I don't really use them in my teaching. And I think that they are overhyped for sure. Um, and we'll talk about why later tonight. I think that scales should be learned and practiced for sure, but there seems to be a lot of emphasis placed on scales um, in the world and in like the piano learning world. And I don't necessarily agree with, um, with the emphasis on like drilling them over and over and over again in your practice endlessly, especially when that practice is mindless. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, I am of the opinion that rhythm should be practiced every single time you practice a piano. So rhythm is, such a foundational skill and we all need to have really good senses of rhythm and that can be developed through practice. And so it's really important to practice rhythm and the same with sight reading. I think a well-rounded um, practice routine really does have a, a sight reading component in it really regularly. If that's not every practice session, that's okay. But as long as it's regular and it's something that you're, you're paying attention to, um, you'll definitely see benefits from that. So if you're a little surprised right now by my opinions on those things, don't worry, you're not the only one. Um, a lot of people, a lot of my students, when I tell them those things are a little bit surprised until we kind of get into it and I show them, you know, the reasoning behind my opinions on those and I show them how I like them to practice those things and then they start to see the benefits and they're usually on board. So um, when we are thinking about practicing scales and technique, of course, those things are important. I don't mean that they're not important, but I often see learners getting stuck on like which exercises to practice or which scales to practice, what books to use, how long to practice them. And it can become a little bit of an, of, a, of like an obsession thinking about like, you know, what do I practice? How long do I practice it? And the big downside to like technical exercises and scales is that if we practice them incorrectly, they actually can have the complete opposite of effect than the one that we intend when we set out to practice them. Um, they can make us sound worse at the piano. They can make our progress slower and they can also potentially lead to injury. And we don't want any of that, right? Nobody wants any of that. So some of the questions that I hear often um, about scales um, and technical exercises 
are questions like this, um, and you can see them up on the screen. So like, how many scales should I practice during each practice session? Or how long should I practice scales? Like for how many minutes? Or for how many weeks, you know, should I practice one single scale? Um, do I need to know all of the scales right now? And I get this question, especially from beginners, from people that are just starting out learning how to play the piano, like how quickly do I need to go through and learn all of the scales? Um, what technical exercises are the best and what technical exercises will help me play faster, better, sound more musical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, fill in the blank here. I'm sure we've all, we've all, you know, had these questions. I know I have, I used to ask these questions all the time, um, before I, before I really got into practicing these kinds of things. And so I think a lot of these questions stem from a couple of rumors or misconceptions that are out there in the piano world. Um, rumors like scales in and of themselves inherently will make you a better musician or that a bulk of your piano practice should be spent drilling technical exercises over and over and over again. Um, I used to have a friend in college who would spend so much time drilling technical exercises and she would do it totally mindlessly. She would like literally read a book while she was practicing the hand and exercises, which is uh, pretty wild. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about why more later. Um, rumors like we need to know all of the scales really quickly in the beginning of piano study or practicing technical exercises will make me a better pianist. There is truth in all of these rumors and misconceptions. There's some truth in there, but, um, but it's kind of hidden in there and we have to dig deep to find the truth because these statements aren't inherently true. So, Instead of focusing on these questions, like how many scales, how long should I practice scales, which technical exercises do I need to practice? There's one question that we can, can ask that can provide us the answers that will give us a foundation of how to approach all of these things in our practice. And this question um, is how should I practice scales, technical exercises, rhythm, and sight reading to ensure that I'm getting the most out of them based on the intention of the exercises. And so that, you know, these things are supporting your ultimate goal of playing and making music at the piano, right? Because that's, that's all of our goal. We all wanna play music. We all wanna create beautiful music. And so if we can ask ourselves how to practice these things to support that goal, we're gonna get so much more out of practicing these things if we get, than if we get caught up on like the, how often to practice or which ones to practice or for how many minutes to practice. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about how to practice all of these things so that they support you gaining the skills you wanna to gain to be a better musician, to make beautiful music at the piano. And we're gonna simplify the process. We're gonna make it easier so that you don't have all of these questions flying around in your head and so that it's easy to gain, gain clarity and to work these things into your practice routine. So please ask questions along the way. Um, I see we have people introducing themselves from all over, that's awesome. Let me know in the chat if these, if these questions are things that you've thought about in your practice before. You know, Have you had those questions of like, how many scales do I practice at one time? Or how many minutes should I be practicing scales a day? And all of those kinds of things. Um, I'd love it if you would share in the chat. All right, we're gonna dive in to scales. So scales, if we think about how to practice scales to best support learning how to play the piano or learning how to make music at the piano, um, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. And these are the things that I always am working with uh, with my students and with students that are in the casual to confident piano player program. Um, to, to implement with their scales. So we want to make sure that we go slow right? The only way to fast is slow. And we talked about this on Monday. This is a good rule for approaching anything at the piano, uh, but especially scales because scales just take time. Ultimately, when we practice scales, they can help us with so many things. They can help us with hand independence. They can help us with hand coordination. They can help us with the theoretical concepts that we need to learn how to play the piano, like reinforcing our key signatures, learning our key signatures. That's a really big one and a great reason to practice scales. But we can't digest all of the information with scales quickly. It's just not possible. In, in all my years of teaching, I will occasionally come across a student that might you know, have some inherent ability with scales, but still it takes time and it takes work and it takes effort. So going slow is going to set us up for success so that we can understand what we're doing so that we can learn things correctly. And so that we don't have to go back and relearn because that is a huge waste of time if we can prevent it. Okay. 
um, we want to make sure that we adjust our scale practice for our level. So there's a lot of different ways to practice scales, right? I, I, you've probably seen, you've probably come across videos of people playing like hands together, four octave scales with like 16th notes really, really, really fast. Of course, you know, that is a goal that you could make. That is one way to practice scales. But when we're starting off, if we're a beginner, we might be doing a one octave scale between two hands, or we might be doing two octave scales hands alone. There are a lot of different ways that we can break it down and adjust for our level so that it's not so overwhelming. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but I have some scale videos that can be helpful with this, uh, breaking it down for your level. Another thing we want to keep in mind when we're practicing scales is that we have to sit with proper piano alignment. Um, so this is foundational for really everything that we're going to talk about today and everything that we do in piano, which is why if we're going to spend the time to drill scales, we want to make sure that we are in total alignment and that we're sitting with the proper posture when we practice those scales. Because the idea is that the scales will help us in our music making, right? And so if we are not sitting in proper piano posture when we're practicing our scales, we're creating habits that of course are gonna leak into other areas of our piano practice. So proper piano alignment is, you know, sitting nice and tall, making sure that you are in the center of the keyboard, making sure that you're sitting on the edge of your bench and that you're the proper distance from the keys. Um, and I have, I have a whole, well, I have a lot of videos on proper piano alignment that are linked in the description of this video. Um, but checking in with yourself about piano alignment is so important for really everything. And especially when we're doing scales. Um, point number four is kind of related to point number two, adjust for your level, which is that a little goes a long way. Um, so when people ask me like, how many scales should I be doing or how, how many minutes should I be spending practicing scales? I usually just say, you know, a little bit like focus on one scale for five minutes in your practice session or three minutes in your practice session. It doesn't have to be a lot because it's, it goes back to that point that we made on Monday about quality over quantity, right? I would so much rather have you spend five minutes of really focused practice, paying attention, following fingering, being really, you know, mindful of what you're doing than to try to spend like an hour practicing scales where you're taking shortcuts and not really paying attention to what you're doing and ultimately practicing mistakes. So a little goes a long way. Um, let's see, I'm just going to check the chat. Oh, that's awesome. Practicing scales and arpeggios in the way I'm talking about. That's great. Two each day. For about 30 minutes. That's awesome. I mean, if the, so it depends on what your goals are, right? And it depends on what you're doing. I would say, I will say, so when I was at like my peak practice in college and grad school and in the years after that, I was practicing like four to eight hours a day and I was spending like 10 to 15 minutes a day on scales. So that was always my maximum because if I went beyond that, I got bored. I couldn't do it and pay attention and I couldn't do it in a way that was helpful to my practice. But if you are able to do scales for 30 minutes and it's helpful and you're seeing the benefit of that and you're able to focus that whole time, then I would say more power to you. Um, but I would just check in with these things that we're talking about, you know, and, and what your goals are. And then try to answer that question for yourself. I would say you could most likely pare it down um, if you wanted to. And then, yes, Joyce is saying practicing scales and different rhythms, dynamics, and articulations. That's exactly right. We're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, one of my favorite things here is point six, which is narrate. And this is one of the most helpful things for practicing scales that I have ever done or that I do with my students. And when we narrate practicing scales, basically what that means is we are saying the finger numbers out loud. And you can do this hands alone very easily because you can just say one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And you can just say the finger numbers out loud. When you do it hands together, you can still narrate. And it might sound a little wild and it will break your brain a little bit. But when you're practicing a scale, and I'm just going to actually, I'll show you really quickly. Um, I'll, I'll use the C major scale for an example. I can actually narrate out loud and say, okay, my right hand is crossing under three. My left hand is crossing over three. My right hand is crossing under four. My left hand is crossing over four. Right hand under three, left hand over three, and then I'm ending. And I can actually talk out loud and tell myself what I'm doing and what the fingering changes are. And this is hugely beneficial. It will be really, really hard to do at first, but it's hugely beneficial because if you are narrating out loud what you're doing, it's impossible not to pay attention to what you're doing. <laughs> and if you're narrating out loud what you're doing, it's also it also makes it very apparent 
very quickly where you don't know what you're doing, right? Where you are unsure of the fingering or where you might have like practiced in some mistakes. And so I have my students narrate all the time when they're practicing scales, at least when they're first starting to learn the fingerings and get, and coordinating the hands together. Um, it will make it harder at first and it might be a little bit frustrating, but ultimately it will lead to such a deeper understanding of what you're doing with the scales. Um, this leads me to point seven, which is to use the post-it method. And you can do this, especially when you're starting to narrate, if you find that it's too overwhelming and you can't do it, um, use the post-it method, which we talked about on Monday a little bit, where you cover up most of the scale and you maybe start with like the first four notes and you just narrate the first four notes. So, you know, okay, one, two, three, and then my thumb crosses under my third finger in my right hand. And then I stop there. And then I play that and my thumb crosses under my third finger in my right hand. And then I stop there. And I do that until that feels easy. And then I move the post to another note or two. And the post-it method is awesome for practicing scales um, and technical exercises and, and a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. There's really nothing that the post-it method can't do. It really works for everything. Um, so if you haven't tried it, definitely try it. I, I have that video that explains it if you don't know what it is linked in the description below. Okay, so incorporating rhythm is point eight, and then turning your scales into exercises with um, different dynamics, articulations, and rhythms. Um, you can do all sorts of these things. So Oftentimes what I'll have my students do when they get to the point that they can play a scale. Well, actually it doesn't really matter. It can be hands alone, it can be hands together, but we almost always use the metronome and we always assign a rhythmic value or a note value to the notes that we're playing of the scale. So if I'm doing a one octave scale, I'll often say that the one octave scale, they're all quarter notes. And so I play one note per click with a metronome. A two octave scale is eighth notes. So there's gonna be two notes for every click with a metronome. A three octave scale is triplets. And then a four octave scale is 16th notes. And you can practice it actually as a long exercise like that if you're advanced enough, or you can work towards practicing it like that. It's a really great way to uh, kind of hit rhythm and scales at the same time um, because you're, you're really working on both fronts. And then, at regardless of the level that you're at, if you get to the point that you're playing a one octave C major scale and you get really comfortable with it, before you move on to the next scale, see if you can get yourself more comfortable by coming up with different dynamics, come up with different articulations, see if you can do different phrases with the scale. So for example, like crescendoing on the way up, decrescendoing on the way down, um, doing it all staccato, maybe playing what's even harder would be doing a decrescendo on the way up and a crescendo on the way down. So messing around with some other musical concepts that you're working on in your pieces and, and applying those to your scales can be a really great way to make sure that the scales are supporting what you're doing in your pieces and, and vice versa. And then when, when all else fails and, and when in doubt, I always say like practice the scale and the key of the piece that you're working on. And we talked about that. Someone mentioned that on Monday. Um, and that's, that's what I do with my students a lot of the time too, is like, if you're new to scales, whatever key, the pieces that you're working on, start with that scale and get really comfortable with that scale because everything you learn in the scale will reinforce the piece and vice versa. So um, I love the things that people are talking about in the chat with scales. These are really great um, suggestions. Let me know if other ways that you practice scales or let me know if you're a total beginner and you haven't practiced scales before, um, but go ahead and share with us in the chat. Um, or if you have any other ideas of things that I did not cover on this slide, I would love to know that as well. So my favorite, um, my favorite book for scales is this Alfred's scale book. Um, and it's, it's super, it's, it's not super expensive. I think it's around $10 and I love it because it's super comprehensive. They have the scale, they have the cadences, they have all of the chords, they have all of the arpeggios, they have everything in there for every single key. And so it's a great book to have. You don't need to get that book and try to do everything on every single page of the book. But if you're wanting to learn scales and you want a book um, that will grow with you, it's a really great book for that. Um, you'll probably only ever have to buy that one book as opposed to buying like a beginner scale book and, and then buying more books later. Um, this is a, just a picture of my website. If, if you go to ashleyjayoung.com slash resources, I have help with scales, like a whole section about help with scales. And I, I did a 14 day piano scale challenge several months ago, but I took every single major and relative minor scale and made a video about them all the notes, all the fingerings, how to practice them. And I included a lot of additional ideas of how to turn those scales into exercises and things like that. So definitely check that out if you need some ideas or help with scales, or if you're not quite sure what to do with scales in your routine, um, that would be a great place to start. Is contrary motion important to practice? Um, 
Oh, and Ashley, you just started working on this book. That's awesome. That's great. I hope you like it. You'll have to let me know how you like it. Um, contrary motion is, yeah, I mean, it's not, so I would say practicing the hands in parallel motion where both hands are going up at the same time, down at the same time is the most important. And then contrary motion can actually be really good if you're starting out because the fingering is the same in each hand at the same time. And I would say if you're playing advanced repertoire, like classical sonatas or like, um, Chopin or list pieces that have like technical cadenzas, contrary motion would be a good thing for you to focus on. Um, I, I would say you don't need to do contrary motion and parallel and parallel motion for every single scale all the time. That would be my advice is kind of pick when you need to do it. And if it's coming up in a piece that you're learning, then definitely spend some time focusing on contrary motion, but it's probably not something you need to do with every single scale. That would be my, my like overall advice without a context. <laughs> um, aiming for a certain tempo. Yeah. Oh, and then the left hand not playing as good as the right hand. Yeah. So, um, aiming for a cer certain tempo is a great question. So ultimately, I mean, it would be great if eventually we could all play scales with a lot of proficiency and like really quickly, but I would say for tempo, we always want to aim for the tempo and this goes for scales and this goes for everything else in your piano playing. You want to aim for the tempo that you can play consistently well. So, um, that might be a slower tempo. If you're just starting out, if you're, you've been working on a scale for a while and you're noticing that you can play it with the metronome at 40 and it's easy now, and you consistently play it like 95% correctly, then I would say you'd be ready to maybe inch that metronome up little by little and see if you can push it a little bit faster. Um, I do, I will usually alternate with my students. So like one scale will focus really on like getting the key signature, getting the fingering and just kind of getting it. And we, we might introduce like one other concept, like articulations or dynamics. And then on the next scale, we'll focus on speeding it up. And then on the scale after that, we'll kind of go back to focusing on other times. So I like to rotate in and out how much I focus on speed because it's not the ultimate goal, right? Our ultimate goal is to do it correctly. So we want to be doing proper fingering, all the stuff from that previous slide. We want to make sure we can do at whatever tempo we're doing. And then we can think about speeding it up. Um, if your left hand is not playing as, as good as your right hand, um, I would think about practicing the left hand alone, like for some of the practice. So if you're going to practice your scales for like five minutes a day, I would say spend three and a half minutes um, with just the left hand and really work on the left hand alone by itself. If you haven't done that already, because it's probably going to become apparent if you do that, what is the problem with your left hand. So it might be an alignment problem. It might be that maybe you're unintentionally like, you know, tensing up your left shoulder. It might be that you're sitting slightly off the center of the keyboard. It could be something like that. Um, it could be often what I see, depending on which hand is your dominant hand. Um, we want to make sure that our fingers are always nice and rounded and that they stay relaxed on the keys. So oftentimes when people are playing, like the fingers are popping up like this when we're playing scales and we really don't want that. We want to keep our hands nice and rounded. And um, if you, if you have been trying with the left hand, but perhaps there's tension or you're frustrated, um, just make sure that you're staying in that relaxed position. Your fingers are rounded. You're on the edge of the keys and, you, and your fingers are relaxed and staying on the keys. That would be my advice for that. And if that doesn't fix it, try that out and come back and comment on this video. I don't give you some more suggestions. Okay. All right. Any other questions about scales? You're welcome to ask them as we go. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to kind of move on and talk about technical exercises, which are very related. So the biggest mistake that I see in technical exercises, really the biggest mistake that I see in all of piano practice, but especially with technical exercises, is mindlessness. When we have a book and we open that book and we sit down to play and we think, okay, I'm going to practice these for 10 minutes and we just go for it. And if you're using a technical exercise that's really repetitive, like Hannon or Cherney, then a lot of the times it's easy to do that. If you've been working on this exercise a lot, like once you get the hang of it, you can just, you can just go for it and you might be able to play it really fast. And it might be kind of fun to do that, to just tune your brain out and to just let it go. But this is one of the biggest mistakes that I see. Um, because the magic with technical exercises happens when we are in the sweet spot of figuring out how to play them well, and also completely being engaged with a specific purpose, a specific why of why we're practicing the exercise. Um, technical exercises on their own, if we practice them mindlessly, don't do much for us. 
you might get a little bit of like hand coordination or hand independence. Um, and sure, you'll learn like some cool patterns on the piano, but that's about it. The, and then anything beyond that is going to become um, detrimental probably if you're practicing them mindlessly. So I think that um, keeping ourselves in check and not turning on autopilot is going to be the best way to practice um, these technical exercises. And I already gave you the example. I, I used to know someone that would like put a book up on the music rack and just read a book while she was practicing. It was either Cherney or Hannon, um, which is just wild. Oh, someone was just doing their scales mindlessly earlier. It's okay, we've all done it. We've all done it. I've totally done it before. I'm still guilty of it. I do it sometimes occasionally. And then I realize after 10 minutes and I'm like, ah, what was I doing? I just wasted 10 minutes. Um, so don't be too hard on yourself, but you know, write about it and, and do it differently next time. All right, so a couple of things to keep in mind for technical exercises to ensure success. What is the purpose of the exercise? And how do I practice the exercise to ensure that I'm achieving the purpose? Now, um, this is going to vary greatly, obviously, depending on the technical exercise that you're working on, right? Because there are books like Hannon and Cherney or like the list technical exercises where if you open them up, you might be able to guess like, oh, this one's to play with speed, or this one is to like help with large intervals or something like that, or this one to help is to help with big chords. But this is something that um, teachers are usually really good at telling you what the purpose of a technical exercise is. Or if you get an edition that has like been heavily edited, where there's like editor's notes about each technical exercise, that can be really helpful. Um, but this is, I do a lot of this in Casual the Confident Piano Player and with my students of just like helping people figure out what the point of the exercises is, or helping people come up with exercises specifically for certain issues, right? Because that's the ideal is that we don't just practice all the technical exercises, but that we get to pick and choose the technical exercises that we practice based on what our issues are and what we're trying to fix. Um, so uh, let's see, we're gonna go on. This is one of my favorite books. It's called A Dozen a Day, and I, I linked it in the description. And like I said, I don't use a ton of um, of technical exercises or technical exercise books, but this is a great one. And I like it because they're short and they're sweet and they get to the point. And after you do a few of them, you can make some educated guesses about what the point of the exercise is. And so in that way, they can be really helpful. So we're going to look at this example and we're going to kind of like try to pick it apart and, and see what the point might be. So, um, you can see that we're, playing a C and a D and we're going back and forth between the C and the D in the first measure. And then in the second measure, we're going back and forth between an E and an F. And then in the third measure, a D and an E. And then in the fourth measure, an F and a G. And I want you to just look at this for a second and I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds. And I want you to think of, if you could think of like all the technical things you need to play the piano, do you have a guess as to what this exercise might be helping you with? Like what would be the purpose of this exercise? Okay, so this exercise is going to give you, um, let's see, we have some accents. And so that's gonna give us a little bit of rhythmic coordination where we're having to focus on the downbeat of every single measure. Um, there's those little accent symbols over every first beat. It's definitely gonna help with hand coordination um, because we're having to do a repeated patterns in each hand, but with different finger numbers. And so that's gonna help with our hand coordination slash independence. Um, it's gonna help us with our finger independence because if you look at this exercise, we're always using two fingers that are right next to each other. And whenever we have to go back and forth between two fingers that are right next to each other, especially in fingers like three, four, and five, um, those are the weak parts of our hands or four and five especially. And so that's gonna be kind of challenging. So it's gonna teach you some finger independence, um, but, this exercise isn't going to teach us any of that unless we know that that's the purpose of it, right? Like if I were just to open this book and start playing and play it through it a couple of times and think, okay, well, that sounds good. I'm going to move on. Then I'm not going to get all of those concepts out of this exercise. If I know that the accents are there to help me with the rhythmic emphasis of beat one, I can make sure that I'm counting and I can make sure that I'm really observing those accents. If I'm thinking about hand coordination, I can be listening and making sure that both notes are sounding at the exact same time in both hands. I can adjust and make adjustments to my alignment and my posture. So like making sure I'm on the edge of the keys, making sure my fingers are nice and rounded. And that will help me ensure that both notes are striking at the same time in each hand. Um, this is gonna help us with a legato touch. 
right? And so making sure that we're listening for that smooth and connected sound between every single note in both hands. Um, but again, if we don't stop to think about the purpose of this exercise, then we're not going to know any of that. So we might not get all of that out of there. Someone said intervals. Yes, that's a that's also um, for sure a purpose of this, like intervals of seconds, definitely. Teach you to emphasize beat one in a two, four tempo. Absolutely. Yes. Great. Good work, everybody. So before we go on to the next slide, someone said, um, can I explain the purpose of Cherny? Just got the book and wonder uh, what it may be doing for you. So Cher um, yeah, so Cherny, the focus is a lot on like being able to do things quickly um, and that hand coordination. So it depends on which specific exercise you're working on in the book. Um, because there's a lot of them, but that's like the main overarching purpose is like speed and hand coordination. Um, but again, keeping in mind the things that we talked about in the slide with scales of like going slow, proper alignment, proper hand position, making sure you're loose at the wrist, make sure you're using the weight of the arm. All of that stuff is so foundational for these technical exercises. Um, so you need to check in and make sure you're doing that when you're practicing those charity exercises. Okay. A sight reading book. Yes, I will recommend a sight reading book. Um, we're actually going to go talk about sight reading later on tonight. And so I'll for sure recommend some sight reading stuff. All right. So here are a couple of the famous exercises. There's List, Hannon, Cherney. Um, there's a ton of them. Bergmuller wrote a bunch of technical exercises. A lot of like famous composers wrote technical exercises. And to my point that I was making earlier, they can they can be very useful um, as long as you are far enough in your studies that you can answer the questions we talked about. Um, and if not, then I would suggest commenting on the video and asking me or working with a teacher or, you know, um, getting some help to, to help you figure out what these technical exercises are all about. The thing that's kind of tricky about technique is it's so specific to the person playing and your body and how you sit at the piano, your goals and what you're trying to accomplish, um, the technical exercise that you're working on, the sound that you're trying to create, and also like what you're doing in that exact moment. So technique is a tricky one. It's a, it's a tough one to like apply overarching um, rules to when we're talking about technical exercises. Okay, so um, these are these are my 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 things that I am trying to apply to all the technical exercises. So if I had to give you some advice on how to practice all technical exercises, um, then these would be them. So one, know the purpose of the exercise, which is what we were just talking about. Two, go slow. You'll hear, you'll hear me say that a lot. <laughs> if you're new here, you'll hear me say that a lot. Um, practice your technical exercises for only short amounts of time. Similar to scales, but I would say more important with the technical exercises because especially if you're working on Cherney or Hannon or like the list technical exercises, they can and often do create tension just by the nature of the fact that they are technically demanding and they take a lot of mental energy. They also wear us out quickly. And so if we can practice them for like three minutes, very focused, that's great because during those three minutes, we have much less likelihood of getting tense and creating pain and leading to injury and all of that. So go for short amount of time. And if you want more technique practice or more technical exercises, I would say do it in chunks, right? So maybe start your practice out with three minutes or five minutes. And then in the middle of your practice, do three or five more minutes. And then at the end, you can do three or five more minutes. So if you're super into these technical exercises, you can definitely work, work them in for more amounts of time, but in small spurts. Like I said, proper piano alignment, so important with everything that we're doing, but especially with the technical exercises, we really need to be mindful of, of how we feel and if, if there's tension happening. Um, we wanna make sure that we're staying really loose in all of our joints of our arms and also um, kind of all over. So making sure that our shoulders are relaxed, making sure that our wrist is loose. And this is a big one. We can have wrist motion that goes up and down, which is going to be really useful for some things. We can also have side to side rotation like this. And we can also have like this pivoting motion, which looks like this, where we kind of pivot at the wrist when we're doing things that require us to like um, stretch. And we want to make sure that we keep our wrist really loose. Wrist tension is the num like one of the number one things that I see go wrong when people are are trying to do technical exercises because they're technically demanding. And so we just tense up, want to make sure to keep our elbow flexible and our shoulders as well. We want to use the weight of our arm. And this is applicable for technical exercises and also scales um, and everything. But we want to make sure that like we're letting the weight of our arm drop in to produce the sound at the piano. Ultimately, 
it doesn't matter what kind of sound we're trying to create, whether it's piano or forte or staccato or legato, it's all about arm weight. That's how we produce a good tone on an acoustic piano. And so making sure that we're letting the weight of our arm drop into the keys, this is very exaggerated and dramatic, but so you get the idea, and not just our fingers. Technical exercises are never about the fingers. Even if we're working for finger independence or finger coordination, it's never supposed to be just the fingers that are moving like that, okay? We always wanna be utilizing the entire arm, the flexibility of all of those arm joints. Um, one of my other suggestions, so if you are feeling overwhelmed by technical exercises, um, or if you don't know where to start with technical exercises, but you're interested in starting new technical exercises, just do five finger patterns. Um, five finger patterns or scales, like we were talking about before, can be amazing technical exercises. And honestly, I do that for the first several years of piano lessons with a lot of my private students is we just work with five finger patterns. There's so much versatility there as far as like changing articulations, dynamics, um, you can do them in different, uh, what am I saying? You can do them in different ranges on the pianos. So you can do them down low, you can do them up high, but they're a great way to check in to make sure that you have that proper hand position. And also the things we were just talking about, like the no tension and the looseness in the wrist and the flexibility and all of that. Um, and they're usually pretty simple after you practice them a little bit. So those are a great technical exercise to start with um, if you're needing somewhere to start. And then lastly, if you're feeling lost about it, consult a professional. Don't ever push through pain. Don't ever think like, oh, I'm just going to do this anyway if you don't know what you're doing because technical exercises can often lead to injury if they're done incorrectly. So we definitely don't want to do that. Um, let's see. A hand in book, lack of motivation. Motivation is a key issue. You know, and I'll, I'll say one more thing about that with like Hannon and Charney and, and some of the list exercises even make music with your technical exercises, right? Like when I'm telling you to play around with articulations and dynamics and the scales, you can do that with your technical exercises as well. And ultimately technical exercises should sound musical because nothing in music is just technical, right? When we're trying to play a piece of music, our ultimate goal is to make music. And so when we're practicing a technical exercise, even though we're focusing, yes, on the technical aspect of playing, we can also still make music and it will make it a lot more interesting for you to practice because it will sound better. And it will also help you support that goal of actually playing music well, um, even better than just focusing on the technical aspect. Okay. All right, let's go on and we're going to talk about rhythm. If you have questions about technical exercises, you know, still type them, type them in the chat. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about rhythm now. Just like Bach. Yes. <laughs> Just like Bach. Play with musicality. Okay. So rhythm practice tips. These are some things. And I, I will say, we'll talk about, I'll put up a slide too. I have like a million videos on rhythm because rhythm is something that is so near and dear to my heart. Um, if you've been around and you've heard me talk about rhythm, you might've heard me say before that I inherently did not have a great sense of rhythm all growing up, taking piano lessons. Like I always felt so behind with rhythm and it was something that I struggled with so badly. And it wasn't until college when I had a teacher that really, um, forced me and took the love and patience and care to like help me get over that and to strengthen that rhythm skill that I started to feel more confident and comfortable with rhythm. And now I do the same with my students because rhythm is the skeleton. It's the skeleton. It's the structure of our pieces. And if we don't have rhythm and if we don't have it, we can't keep a steady pulse and we don't know the rhythmic um, values of our notes, we are going to be so, 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 so lost. So I have the people that I'm working with practice with them every single day. Um, it's a great way to support a strong sense of musicality. And it's a great way to ensure that you are like building your rhythm skills, just like anything else. We focus so much on note reading, right? We want to make sure that we're fast and good at note reading. We should do the same thing with rhythm. We should make sure that we are fast and good at interpreting rhythms, just like we are with note reading. So um, working from a rhythm book is a great way to do this. And you can just schedule time into your practice routine three to five minutes, or maybe you can make it a part of your pieces. So you could also just say, okay, for the first, you know, if you don't have to put a time on it, but just before I play my pieces, before I get into the playing part of my pieces, I'm going to go through and I'm going to put on the metronome and I'm going to clap and count the rhythm out loud. And that's a really great way to incorporate rhythm into your practice routine without any extra materials. So rhythm tips for, or uh, practice tips for rhythm, go slow. Um, always count out loud. Yes, always always count out loud, always count out loud. Um, make yourself count out loud. It will 
make you a better musician. I promise. Just do it. Even if it's hard, even if you feel like it's messing you up, it's not messing you up. It's just making your errors more apparent. Make yourself count out loud. It will be a total game changer. Um, tapping and counting out loud the rhythm. So for example, taking a piece that you're working on and turning on the metronome and tapping everything that you would play with the right hand with the right hand and tapping everything that you would play with the left hand with the left hand and doing it in coordination, counting out loud, just like you would do if you were playing it, but you're only focusing on the rhythm. Um, using the metronome is a great way. And I have a lot of videos that suggest um, ways to just get comfortable with the metronome. The metronome is, is tricky and oftentimes Actually, I would say every time that I have a student start practicing with a metronome, it's not easy. It's not something that people usually have an inherent ability to do. The metronome is a tool and it's a tool that we have to learn how to use. And so there are a lot of really simple exercises you can do to help yourself get more comfortable with a metronome, simply turning on the metronome and clapping along with it and just trying to, you know, like get that steady beat at different tempos is like the most foundational and best thing you can do if you're afraid of the metronome or if you don't use the metronome regularly. And I linked a ton of videos in the description of this video about, um, I have a video that has a free PDF with it of rhythm exercises where I go through and practice them with you. I have a video with one of my favorite rhythm books that's amazing. Um, and I have like so many other rhythm videos, they're all in the description. Um, starting with simple examples and working from there is a really great way to approach rhythm, just like with everything. I love writing the counting in my music as a visual representation of the rhythmic values of the notes. So actually like writing in one, two, three, four, if you're counting one and two and three and four and writing that in your music, I'm a visual learner. Um, and if, if you're already looking at the music, having those numbers there lining up with the beats can be really helpful. And when you write the rhythm, make sure that you write it between the hands. So like if your right hand is up here in the treble clef and your left hand is down here in the bass clef, write the rhythm right in the middle. That's the best place to write the rhythm because you can see where the hands are lining up. Um, and then you won't get it confused with like the fingering numbers above the right hand or below the left hand or anything like that. Um, number eight, I already said, so just practice finding different tempi on the metronome and you can do it how I was saying, where you just turn on the metronome and practice clapping with it. And then eventually you can do it where you like turn on the metronome, start clapping and then turn the metronome off and see if you can keep clapping at that same speed and then turn the metronome back on and see if you got faster or see if you got slower. Um, and, and like what your tendencies are and you'll, your, what your tendencies are and you'll learn about yourself as a rhythmic human and, and what you tend to do. And then you can adjust for that. Um, so when we talk about rhythm, it, it can be kind of a, a tricky concept because there's the rhythmic values that we're always trying to interpret, the rhythm on the page that we're seeing, so the rhythmic values of the notes. And then there's also this idea of like your inner pulse, your ability to keep a steady beat, right? And we need to develop both. And oftentimes um, we can do one better than the other, um, but it's hard to merge the two. So I would suggest spending some time practicing, developing your inner pulse. And these are things that I was just, I was just suggesting. So practicing clapping along with the metronome. Um, another one you can do is you can turn on the metronome and practice clapping different note values. And I'm gonna show you that one because that's like a hugely helpful exercise. So here's Mr. Penguin. Uh, so here we turn on the metronome and we just clap quarter notes. And then we practice switching to eighth notes. One and one. And then we practice switching to triplets. Triplet, triplet. And then we practice going to 16th notes. And you might, if that's, if you don't, if you're not already familiar with all of those note values, you might just start with like quarter notes and eighth notes. And you might do 50 quarter notes in a row and then 50 beats of eighth notes in a row. Um, and you can do that repeatedly over and over and over again. Um, that's a really great way to develop an inner pulse. And I used to, I'm not gonna recommend this cause it's dangerous, but I used to in college, I used to just take my metronome with me in the car. And when I was sitting in traffic, I would just turn the metronome on and I would just talk through different rhythms and count them out loud. Um, and it, it was a huge game changer. So while you're doing dishes or, you know, while you're doing something where you're like waiting, um, that's a great way to help you develop your inner sense of pulse. Uh, what, so my friend, Stephanie, who some of you have seen here on the channel, she's amazing. Um, she does this exercise that I love that I've started to do with my, my students as well, where we can step with the metronome. So actually like get up and walk and step with the metronome and then clap the different note values. And that's such a cool way to just help you internalize that pulse in a different way because you're incorporating another part of your body. Um, and so it really helps you feel that pulse. 
And then, like I said, um, go ahead and watch some other videos on the subject for my channel. There's a million of them. Um, how about counting rhythm using words? So I think that's a great idea. And Joyce, that's a really great point. Um, I do do that sometimes. I don't do that exclusively, but I do do it sometimes because like I was kind of mentioning, we always have like the, the rhythmic values that are represented on the page by the notes. And then we also want to be able to feel it. Right. Ultimately, when we're counting and when we're trying to develop this sense of inner pulse, we're trying to teach ourselves how to feel the rhythm. And so putting words to the rhythm can be really helpful at bridging the gap between like being able to count it on the page and being able to feel it internally. But I would I would say use them in tandem, use both of them. So especially like if there's teachers here with young students, you can use words, but then also teach them the counting because the counting helps you understand it on a deeper level. And the counting gives you the structure within the context of the whole piece. And that's where I see people doing just words and then never moving on to the counting. And then things get really dicey later on when they're trying, when it starts to move into the other layers of their memory and all of a sudden their ability to play the rhythms goes out the window or the coordination between the hands goes out the window because they don't have those anchors of the beats showing them exactly where they are in every measure and where they are in the context of the piece. So yes to words and then also move to counting eventually after those words help you. That's a really, really, really great question. Okay, so same spot on the resources page of my website, I have a help of rhythm section. This is, these are all my favorite rhythm things and um, my rhythm video playlist. Um, this is Mr. Penguin metronome. Um, and then there's a digital metronome. Digital metronomes are nice because you can turn the sound off. And so you can just see the flashing light, um, which if you watch some of my other rhythm videos, you'll see why, um, why I like that. And then the rhythm book that I, um, that I recommend. So that is my help with rhythm. One second, I'm just gonna get rid of some of these. Okay, so any questions about rhythm, go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, rhythm, I'm a fan in case you could tell, but I am a new fan because I wasn't always a fan because it was something that I really struggled with, um, but I'm just a believer in it now and, and how important it is. All right, so the last thing that we're gonna talk about tonight is sight reading. And then I'm gonna take some, some questions at the end and go over some questions that people send in. Um, so success with sight reading starts with some of these things. We always wanna practice sight reading at a lower level than what we regularly play, okay? Because the goal of sight reading, when we truly are like sitting there and reading something for the very first time, and we're practicing the skill of sight reading, the goal is to play something as well as possible on the very first try. So sight reading is different than learning how to read notes, right? We need to learn how to read notes. And I have a lot of videos on that. And I see the terms used interchangeably in different groups, um, almost synonymously, but they're different. So we have learning how to read music. That's a skill. And we can practice flashcards and we can use sight reading to help our reading music skills. But when we practice sight reading, we're actually making the goal to like sit there and try to do it as well as possible on the first try. So that's why we want to start at a lower level than what we play at, because I mean, I might not be able to pull out like a list piano concerto and sight read it or one of the, you know, like one of the really technically demanding list pieces and sight read it um, with the same ability that I would play it at. And so we want to sight read at a little bit of a lower level. We want to incorporate it into our practice, into our daily practice, or into at least our weekly practice. Um, we always want to count out loud and go slower than we think we need to go. There's that going slow thing again. We want to use the metronome. And because our goal is to play it as well as possible on the very first try, we want to not stop and not go back. Okay. So we want to try to play like from the beginning to the end, regardless of what mistakes happen, regardless of what happens, we don't want to go back and we don't want to stop. We want to just try to kind of like power through. Um, and like I said, we're trying to play it as well as possible on the first try. So these are the like fundamental um, basics with sight reading. Now, this slide has a lot on it, and this is in your PDF that you get for tonight, so you'll have all of this. Um, but when we sight read, we always want to look before we play, okay? And I'll recommend some sight reading books in a minute that are really good because they are um, small, short, and sweet exercises that are meant to incorporate like one at a time into your practice routine. So I always say set a timer for like five minutes and force yourself to be a detective and to look at the music for five minutes, 
Okay. And during that time, you're going to look through the rhythm and the counting. You're going to actually turn on the metronome and clap or tap and count out loud the entire exercise. So you have a good sense of what the rhythm sounds like. You're going to look at the articulation, the dynamics, the fingerings and the hand position changes. You're going to look at the key signature, the time signature, the pedal markings, any other symbols, and you're going to look for patterns. You're going to look for surprises or deviations from the patterns that might mess you up. You're going to look for aspects of musicality, like the title. Does it have like a really descriptive title, like the, the storm? Um, you're going to look at the tempo marking, all of that kind of stuff. You want to look and find the melody. And you want to see, I mean, if you're at a point in your music studies where you can like analyze chords, um, you would maybe analyze the chords, or maybe you're at a point where you can look at like intervals and recognize them. That would be something you can do as well. Um, and then you want to look for any things that might be unexpected or any areas that you might make a mistake. Okay. I know that's a lot and I'm going through it kind of fast because we're getting to the end here. Um, but you want to, you want to look through all of that in about five minutes. And I'm curious in describing this, let me know in the chat, who does this? Who does this, all of this, as a regular part of your practice routine already um, if you are practicing sight reading? And let me know if you don't do this. Like if you practice sight reading, but you haven't done it in this way before, let me know in the chat. Um, so then once you've set your timer and you've gone through all of that for about five minutes, you're gonna mock play. And that's on the other side of the slide. And when we mock play, what we do is we place our hand on the keys and we turn on the metronome and we count out loud and we play through the piece without actually making any sound. Okay, so we like pretend to play, we move our fingers, but we're not actually making any sound. And what we're doing when we're mock playing is <clears throat> we're giving ourselves a chance to see what might surprise you, what might trip you up, where you might make mistakes before you're actually sight reading the pieces, the piece and producing sound. So if you practice sight reading and you go through these steps that I'm talking about, where you set that timer for five minutes, you force yourself to look for a full five minutes and you investigate and you're a detective and you look at all these things and then you mock play the piece and then you turn the metronome on to a reasonable tempo and you count out loud and you try to sight read a piece your success is going to skyrocket through the roof i promise you this is like a surefire way to be a better sight reader and then the other key is you have to be doing it at a level that is appropriate to you so when we um Think about sight reading, we always wanna go down a level. And I would say, unless you're at an advanced level, you could probably start at the beginning levels because it's not gonna hurt you. It's only gonna help you develop those foundational skills. When we're sight reading, it's about that process. That is what sight reading is about. Yes, we wanna play the notes correctly and we wanna be able to read the notes, but if you are going through that process that I just described for sight reading of looking for five minutes and then mock playing, you will get better. You absolutely will. It never fails if you're doing it correctly. And so my favorite um, sight reading series are this one right here, um, Sight Reading and Rhythm Every Day by Helen Marley. And it starts down, I think, even with level A and B. And then it goes to like level 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. And it's amazing. Every single, it's, it's meant to be practiced in days. So it's like a five, day, five days per unit. And you have a little rhythm exercise and a little sight reading exercise every single day. And it goes all the way through level eight. Um, and I've taken several students through the entire series and it's amazing what it can do. And then my other favorite book is um, the Keith Snell and Martha Ashley sight reading uh, series um, and Diane Heidi, sorry. Um, and that one starts at a preparatory level and goes, I think all the way through level 10, if I'm not mistaken. And this one is different because it has less direction, okay? So if you're new to sight reading and you really want to like develop this skill to sight read, I would say start with the, um, the Sight Reading Rhythm Every Day by Helen Marley. If you've already done some sight reading and you're playing pretty advanced repertoire, I would say the Keith Snell would be a good one to start with. It's There's not nearly as much direction. It's just short musical examples. And a lot of them are by composers that you might've heard of, um, but they're like little snippets of the pieces and things like that that are kind of um, simplified or made much smaller and much shorter, um, but not nearly as much direction in that book, but it definitely has a purpose. So um, I am hoping that all of these random comments that I had to remove didn't break the chat. Oh, there we go. Okay. Someone else chatted in. <laughs> Let me know. I'm really curious to know who's practicing sight reading in this way, or if you have another way that you've been practicing sight reading. Um, I encourage you to do this. It's going to totally, it's going to rock your world. And let me know if you have questions about sight reading. So we are now at the point where I'm going to go through a couple of the questions that people 
um, filled out in the form that they submitted ahead of time. And then I'm also willing to take questions um, from the chat as well. So someone asked how to play arpeggios faster and sm more smoothly. Um, and for this, I would say a few things. So first of all, Similarly to what we were talking about with technique, I would say check your alignment, make sure that you are playing with rounded fingers and that you're on the edge of the keys. And when we play arpeggios, there's one key thing that's gonna slow us down and it's letting our fingers lead us across the keys. Um, because when we're playing, well, and this is actually true of scales as well. Um, whenever we're trying to do anything with speed, like I mentioned, if we leave it up to the fingers and we're trying to like let our arm follow our fingers, we're never going to be able to move fast because our fingers, don't have muscles in them. They're not very strong. Our fingers on our, on their own can't do a ton. It really requires our entire arm and really our entire body. So to make your arpeggios faster, first of all, and smoother, make sure that you are leading with the arm. So instead of taking my hand and playing individual notes like this and like letting my fingers guide me up the keys, watch my elbow. Did you see how much my elbow was going out and coming back in? And I'm really swinging at the elbow and I'm using my arm to guide my hand up and down the keys, as opposed to trying to let my fingers guide me. So that's the first thing. Um, that's the number one thing. And then I would say, once you've done that, um, do them in rhythms and do them with flash practice. And that's going to help you a lot. Um, and if you don't know what rhythms and flash practice are, I linked them there. I described those practice methods in the post-it method video as well. And that's in the description below. So go ahead and check in with that. Um, let's see. Another question we got was uh, a terrible left hand, slow and clunky, and would love exercises to help build up the coordination, strength, and of course, speed. Any tips on hands together is also appreciated. That's a really great question. And you just summed up a lot of, a lot of problems that I see. So for hands together, for playing hands together, the number one thing that's going to be a game changer is counting out loud. And I know that might seem like not related at all because counting out loud is a rhythm thing, but counting out loud is really actually a coordination thing as well. Because whenever we're trying to make these five fingers do something at a certain time and these five fingers do something at a certain time and we need to coordinate them together, they both have to have a very good sense of what they're doing in order to be able to coordinate. So if I'm practicing my right hand alone and I'm practicing my left hand alone and I'm not counting and then I throw them together, they have no idea like how to do it together. Whereas if I practice my right hand at and I'm counting out loud, I practice my left hand and I'm counting out loud, there's a common thread that ties them together. And they both know when and where they're supposed to play. And so the chances of me being able to play hands together is much higher if I'm counting out loud. Um, and then with hand coordination, I would start with five finger patterns. Um, and I have a video about five finger or um, about, yeah, major, major and minor five finger patterns. And that's linked in the chat. And um, start with that and start really slow. Start with C, D, E, F, G and see if you can play both hands, C, D, E, F, G going up and down with each note sounding at the exact same time. Making sure that your hands are on the edge of the keys. You're not up here in the black keys, they're on the edge of the keys. Your fingers are nice and rounded and you don't have anything popping up, okay? Now, if you do this and you get that down with C major, um, if you do that every day in your practice, you will find that within a couple of weeks, your hands are gonna be a lot more coordinated and there's gonna be just a lot more synchronicity between the two. So I would start with that. And if that's too easy, um, do it before you say it's too easy. But if that's too easy, or if you get the hang of that, then comment in this video and let me know and I'll give you some more suggestions. All right, someone asked how to play legato octaves. And this is an awesome question. And I am gonna not answer it because I just filmed a video about it. So I actually have a video coming out in like the next week and a half about how to play legato octaves. So who, well, it's it's about how to play octaves in every context, but I cover legato octaves in that video. Um, so uh, make sure to look out for that one. And I will cover that extensively in that video. All right, last question. Oh no, there's a lot more questions. Well, last question for tonight. Um, jump in the chat if you want to get in there. We're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here in a minute. Um, so I keep losing motivation to sit down when I sit down to practice because I don't know what to practice. Scales, arpeggios, etc. Hopefully, at this point, you have a better idea. Um, if you watched all of today's class, and if you go back, if you didn't get a chance to watch Monday's class, where we talked about like planning out practice and time management and how to journal and all of that, um, that should answer all of those questions. And if it doesn't, then comment and, and ask it again, and I'll, I'll answer it and give you more in depth. Okay. Um, 
All right, everybody, this has been wonderful. This has been so amazing. I just threw so much information at you. So take the information that I gave you today, take the PDF and work back towards what we did on Monday also, and make sure you go back to Monday and take these things in small doses and apply them to your practice in little tiny chunks. I don't expect that after tonight, you're going to be like a complete, you know, expert on all of these things, but you now have a lot more information and a lot more ways to approach these things. Um, Someone asked one other question. Do you believe that the mechanical metronome is better than the digital metronome? Honestly, they both have their own purpose. I have my mechanical mechanical metronome because it doesn't ever run out of batteries and I use it so much that I, I just, I, my default is that, but I do use a, a digital metronome because I like the turning off the sound element and being able to see the light. And you can do that with an app on your phone as well. Um, so there's purposes for both. Um, all right. So the last thing I wanted to leave you with is Friday. So Friday is the last night of this boot camp, and I'm going to give you your homework for Friday. Um, you're going to pick a scale, and I want you to focus on that one scale for the next week. And I want you to do everything that I say in the PDF and track your progress using Monday's practice journal. Um, and then I want you to check in with yourself in a week and see how different you feel after doing that. I want you to take stock of your technical exercises. If you're not practicing them, do you, or sorry, if you're practicing them, do you know the purpose? If not, try to figure it out. If you can't figure it out, let me know. I'll help you. Um, and if you do know the purpose, make sure you're practicing it the correct way. If you aren't practicing technique, incorporate one five finger exercise and use it as a technical exercise with the way that I just described. Brainstorm ways to incorporate more rhythm and sight reading in practice into your practice and routine. And then join me on Friday. And before you go, I'm so excited for Friday because I mentioned this on Monday. Friday is going to be like you can join me in the Zoom session. So right now y'all are watching the live stream and the first 100 people can actually join me live in Zoom. You can have your camera on, you can set yourself up by your piano and you can actually ask specific questions. Um, and I hope that you take me up on that because Friday's class is entirely a Q&A. So you can submit questions in the comments of this video or you can show up on Friday. Um, if that sounds terrifying or if you're too late and you don't get into the Zoom room, you can also just watch as a live stream. But I really want you in there because I want to help you. Um, and also, I'm I'm super compassionate. I've been doing this a long time. So any question that you ask is going to be a question that I have most likely heard before and have answers to. Um, and you will be in a kind and respectful and supportive environment. So I look forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Friday at 7.30 PST. I will see you there. 